This is A Word for Today, Season 2. My name is Brent Chies. And I am Pastor Stefan Chauvet, welcoming you today. If you're joining us for the first time, we want to say welcome to our expanding family. And if you're already familiar with this exciting show, we want to welcome you back in Jesus' name. Today's episode is the continuation of last week's intriguing message. It is part two of Signs and Times, a tale of two Gospels. God's Word is anything but boring. With so many lessons and examples, and with such a wealth of material, today's topic is simply couldn't be covered in a single episode. So you might want to have pen and paper to take notes as, using the Bible and examples from history, Pastor Chauvet continues with the second part of his message entitled, Signs and Times, A Tale of Two Gospels. Hello everyone and welcome to this segment of our show called Discovering the Footsteps of God, where we study the past in the light of Bible prophecy. I am your host, Pastor Stéphane Chauvet, speaking to you from beautiful Montreal, Canada. Today, as we continue our spiritual journey with the second part of Signs and Times, I want to remind our viewers that our ultimate goal is to glorify the Lord by revealing His footsteps in the pages of history. As far as I'm concerned, Nothing's more important in life than learning about God and exalting the glorious name of Jesus. You know, lots of work went into the production of A Word for Today. Countless hours and many sleepless nights were invested to produce these shows. We hope, therefore, you will appreciate this labor of love in Christ Jesus. We pray it triggers an insatiable craving to learn more about God and His Holy Word. As I've said in previous episodes, Spiritual hunger is a great mover, causes the soul to look for greener pastures. And those who thirst for the things of God long to obey the truth and not ancient religious traditions. That is the reason why this media ministry was put together. It was created to unveil the presence of the Almighty in the chapters of history. It should give birth to a supernatural appetite to learn more about God's omnipresence in the affairs of mankind. After watching a few episodes, I believe the Holy Spirit will stir within you a profound desire to learn more about Jesus and His divine influence He has exerted over humanity. Always remember, the Son of God is the central figure of history. There's none like Him. And once you taste of His goodness, nothing else will satisfy your soul. Over the course of time, God's wonderful deeds have been documented and celebrated by believing scholars. However, at the other end of the spectrum, secular historians have turned a blind eye and disregarded the works of the Almighty, labeling them as mere coincidence or as the work of nature. The story of the Exodus is surely a prime example where historical bias has dominated the narrative. For years now, the crossing of the Red Sea has generated extremely diverse opinions, and people of faith have been dismissed as simpletons. Jews and Christians alike believe that God miraculously saved the Israelites from Egyptian slavery through a succession of divine interventions, while skeptics and traditional historians are convinced that mere natural disasters call the liberation of Moses and his people, both sides claiming to hold a copyright on the truth. Search the libraries, and you will find that modern scholars never give credit to the Lord for his miraculous involvement in the story of men. For them, events related to matters of faith are relegated to the section of myths and legends. In their mind, when it comes to loving the Lord, passions gets mistaken for stupidity. So-called experts think that everyone who believes in Jesus must be intellectually impaired. For them, intelligent people are less likely to become religious, even less likely to be Christians. And yet, by assuming that people of faith are academically inferior, they totally ignore the fact that some of the most intelligent people that ever lived on the face of the earth were actually genuine believers in Christ. From Isaac Newton to Blaise Pascal, some of the wisest men who adorn our history books were in fact committed Christians. While it is true that there's plenty of intellectual prodigies in the camp of the Lord, it's also true that widespread corruption has eclipsed the achievements of a wise Christian church. 
While it is true that the wonderful teaching of Jesus has enriched empires and cultures over the centuries, far too many fairy tales have been wrongfully attributed to Christianity. Scores of spiritual zeros have emerged as religious heroes through the eyes of a distorted Christian faith. This is certainly a troubling facet of church history. The lack of historical accuracy among the people of faith must constantly be addressed. Several revisions are required to eliminate these fallacies. Urban legends are oftentimes circulated by well-intentioned, yet ill-informed believers. It's quite regrettable. And because of this constant religious distortion, many souls have altogether rejected the pure message of Jesus Christ over the centuries. Now, it is true that believers have a tendency to embellish the facts. But it's also true that atheists have a tendency to reject the truth. This sad reality has been witnessed countless of times over the years. But nowhere has this intolerance for the truth has been more obvious than in the world of academia. In the last few decades, we have witnessed the emergence of a highly educated generation suffering from historical amnesia. It's truly an alarming paradox. The lessons of the past are forgotten too quickly or simply ignored. It's scary. If left untreated, this intellectual slumber could prove to be disastrous for years to come. As an ordained minister of the gospel, it is therefore my duty to lift up the name of Jesus and highlight his divine presence in the chronicles of humanity. It is my responsibility to share the good news of salvation in Christ Jesus without adding religious fables. And that's difficult. I must educate the sheepfold of the Almighty with biblical truths and historical facts. As I've said many times before, it's not because the tomb is empty that our mind has to be. When it comes to the reality of supernatural manifestations, God does not need our help to confirm his abilities. No one needs to fabricate stories of miracles to prove his existence. Sticking to the truth is convincing enough anyway. God's word alone has the power to bring true salvation to the seeking heart. Moreover, the Lord has already left unquestionable proofs of his goodness and mercy for each generation to behold. For, Scripture says that the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. As for me... Spending the rest of my life seeking his footprints on the shores of history is definitely not a punishment. On the contrary, it's such a blessing. It's a divine assignment that I have humbly accepted years ago. In fact, I firmly believe the Lord had already placed this calling on my life while I was in my mother's womb. As far as I can remember, the reality of Jesus always flowed in my veins. He was real to me back then. And he's still real to me today. And even though I suffered ridicule and was often criticized for my fate over the years, I do not mind the opposition. I would rather please my heavenly father than this world anyway. For seeking his face will always be my life's greatest passion. And that will never change. In these last days, there are very few true pastors left in the field of the Lord. Finding a good church that faithfully preaches the word of God is a challenging quest. Those who desire to serve the Almighty in spirit and in truth have a difficult task ahead. There's plenty of groups promoting a selfish gospel. But rare are the places of worship where the saints are taught to die to self, to deny their egos, and to pick up their crosses. There are plenty of gathering places where Satan is comfortable and plenty of meeting halls where the Holy Spirit is grieved. But sadly, there are very few sanctuaries left where the pure teaching of the gospel goes forth. In the words of the Apostle Paul, very few are seeking the interest of Christ Jesus. And that is exactly where I want us to concentrate today. In the first part of this series, we have demonstrated that our modern times are very similar to that of Noah and Lot, as prophesied in the Bible. We also have recognized that the morals of this present age are nearly as identical to that of the corrupt Roman Empire. But in this second part of Signs and Times, I want us to focus on the existence of two parallel churches, both running in totally opposite directions. The first observes man-made religious traditions, 
while the second obeys the word of God. The first is visible and often seen on the news, while the other is invisible and ignored by the media. A church that is dressed in religious vestments and the other clothed with Christ. A church that has abandoned the true faith to receive men's approval, while the other has retained the words of Jesus and has suffered persecution. The first has burned believers at the stake, while the other has received the fire of the Holy Ghost. It's the story of two churches, one that is worldly and another one that is godly. It's a tale of two Gospels, the Gospel of self versus the Gospel of Christ. Now, if there ever was a clear sign indicating that we're living in the last days, it's definitely the existence of an apostate church claiming to be the true body of Christ. As we're approaching the end of time, we are witnessing the growing influence of a backsliding church which professes to hold dear to the doctrine of Christ, while at the same time, it constantly opposes the Word of God. From the main issues of our time to the fundamentals of Christianity, this worldly church spreads a message that is contrary to the instructions of Jesus. They wear the cross of Christ around their neck, but Christ is not in their heart. They take communion every Sunday, but they never have communion with the Holy Spirit. And as far as I'm concerned, nothing heralds the second coming of Jesus Christ more than this great falling away from the faith. The end time apostate church was described by Jesus in the book of Matthew and prophesied by the great apostle Paul in his second letter to the Thessalonians. From the scriptures, we learn that both Jesus and Paul points to a drifting away from the Christian faith in the last days. Inspired by the word of God, I also believe that those who will ultimately abandon Christ are mainly nominal Christians. Yes, I am convinced that those who will forsake Jesus in the end times are Christians by name only. Even though they profess to love Jesus, they will betray him with a kiss. Ouch. Talk about deja vu. Over the years, there has been much confusion as to what it means to be a genuine follower of Christ. For the most part, casual churches attendees have held a rather broad definition of the word Christian. They think that it's by simply obeying ancient rituals you will get through the pearly gates. But even though there are plenty of people loosely claiming to follow Jesus, you and I should remember that not everyone will spend eternity in heaven based on their observance of religious traditions. For example, Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin were both baptized as infants. And yet, unless they repented of their sins before dying, no one believed that these two psychopaths who have murdered millions upon millions will have a place with the saints in the kingdom of heaven just because they were baptized. No way. Actually, to be accurate, the words of Jesus should be our ultimate guide if we honestly seek to determine who is a true Christian. Yes, the scriptures alone have the answer. Not the Pope, not the televangelist, and certainly not CNN. The Son of God specifically said that not everyone who calls him Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who does the will of his Father. The Lord is pretty clear about this. We know that the words of Jesus are intended for each and every generation. Without exception, the Lord had every human being in mind when he spoke these words. Young and old, short and tall, male and female, his plea for repentance is for the whole world. Everyone ought to surrender to his Holy Spirit. Across the ages, his voice still can be heard, urging humanity to turn away from sin and come to the cross of Calvary. He declares that if we say we love him, we ought to keep his word. So you see, there's no room for misinterpretation in the sayings of Jesus. To be a Christian, we must be Christ-like. No more, no less. We must pick up our cross and follow him. If we want to enter through the pearly gates of paradise, we must obey his word. Yes, in the end, we must all surrender our hearts to the master. And that Hitler and Stalin did not do. When it comes to a proper definition of the word Christian, I agree with the point of view of renowned apologist Francis Schaeffer. Like him, I also believe that the word Christian holds two distinct meanings. First, it is employed in the context of census and demographics. 
As such, the term Christian is applied to someone who is part of a Christian community. And so, according to United Nations statistics, one-third of the world's population has been labeled as Christian, ranging from Catholics, Orthodox, to Protestants. But in this broad kind of classification, more precision is needed. Even though a third of our world carries the title of Christian, we cannot conclude that each of them is a genuine Christian in the true sense of the word. Indeed, some may carry the name of Christian in public settings, but they certainly do not carry the words of Christ in the privacy of their lives. Oh no, my friend, I know I may sound horribly dogmatic right now, but the title of Christian should strictly be reserved to those who are committed to follow Jesus Christ and obey his holy word, period. As I'm sharing with you the proper definition of being a Christian, there is actually in the spiritual realm a non-going separation between true Christians and those who are in name only. In fact, that is one of the clearest signs of the end times. Remember what we've learned in the last episode. Jesus said, the end shall be like the beginning. And so, because we believe we're living in the last days, it's only wise for believers to read the first chapters of the Bible and see what God has done first and translate his action into today's end time scenario. And guess what? Lo and behold, according to the scriptures, we discovered that in the beginning, one of the first things that the Lord did was to separate light from darkness. Hmm. Can you see where I'm going with this? Follow me now. If God's first act in the beginning of time was to separate light from darkness, should we expect at the end of time that his last action entails a separation as well? <laughs> of course we should. We are told by Jesus that the end shall be like the beginning. In fact, as I said before, I believe we are presently undergoing a spiritual separation between light and darkness. A separation between true Christians and those who are Christians in name only. And ultimately, this separation process will culminate in a climatic event called the rapture. At the sound of the last trumpet, the Lord will take his bride. The true church will be snatched out of this world. And that will be the ultimate supreme act of separation. Oh, wow. Can I hear an amen? You see, in the end times, the Bible speaks of professing Christians departing from the faith. And coincidentally, before the coming of the Lord, the Bible also speaks of genuine Christians departing from this earth. The Greek word for each departure is the same. It's apostasia, meaning to depart. So no matter how you look at it, there is a separation, a departure, either from the faith or from this earth. Well, guess what? I choose the latter. I would rather meet Jesus in the air than leave my Bible on the shelf. Praise God. What a glorious day that will be. We should all learn from this amazing parallel. Now, this supernatural event is not pie-in-the-sky theology. Not at all. It was also announced in the Old Testament 3,000 years ago. Yes, the long-awaited rapture was foreshadowed in the book of Exodus, where we can read that God separated the Israelites from the Egyptians and took them out of Egypt through the splitting of the Red Sea. I guess we've all seen the movie The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. What an amazing picture. But before this dramatic event takes place, there is much to do. Spiritually speaking, the separation process is actually unfolding each day in the believer's life. Even the great apostle Paul admonishes the New Testament church to be separated from this world. In a nutshell, he instructs us that we should not talk like the world, we should not think like the world, and certainly we should not behave like the world. According to scriptures, we must be holy for the Lord is holy. The apostle Paul is not the only one who speaks of parting ways with this whole world. I tell you, this separation revelation is omnipresent in the word of God. It's everywhere, almost on every page. It permeates Judeo-Christian doctrine. And not surprisingly, that is exactly what is happening at this moment in the Western world. We are witnessing a definite separation in the spiritual realm, a splitting between those who obey his word and those who resist his Holy Spirit. In these last days, the Almighty is drawing a clear demarcation between the sons of God 
and those who belong to the world. Believers in Christ, please do not grieve the Spirit of God. Yield your heart and submit to His Word before it's too late. Since the message of the Gospel is deemed too controversial by our society, organized religion and traditional churches have ran away from the Word of God and instead have adopted a fruitless spirituality that pleases the masses. And because they have abandoned the true Christian faith, well, true Christian followers have abandoned these kind of churches. Just consider how many Catholic and Orthodox churches have been sold and converted into condos in recent years. This mass exodus is sending out shockwaves across all of Christendom. While traditional churches are emptying out, the assemblies that faithfully teach the message of Jesus are thriving. There is indeed a separation happening in the spiritual realm. God's people are flocking to where God's word is shared, and none should be surprised by this changing of the guard. The Almighty has warned us in the book of Malachi that such a day would come. He told us that we should see the difference between the godly and the ungodly before the end. Well, I think these days are here now. So those who desire to obey Jesus no matter what the cost, I say put on your spiritual seatbelt for it's going to be a bumpy ride. As I've said before, many religious leaders from traditional denominations have rejected the scriptures because they were judged too offensive. For them, the content of the Bible is definitely not politically correct. And so, as a substitute, they have created a new Christianity fashioned after their own sinful image. A permissive Christianity. A selfish Christianity that fits our epoch and our modern times. By doing so, they have become enemies of God. They have created a Christianity without Christ. It's a counterfeit Christianity a morally flexible faith free from the constraint of biblical demands. And sadly, to the unsuspecting soul, this form of godliness is quite attractive. It offers blessings without consecration. And that is why it's so deceiving. It promises salvation without true repentance. What a crafty lie. But don't be fooled. This religious fruit may be pleasant to the eyes, but it's rotten to the core. Do not eat of it. Remember what happened to Adam and Eve when they were tempted. And remember that the end shall be like the beginning. Now, it's already time to conclude this second part of Signs and Times. From the outset, I warned you that this four-part series could be challenging and quite difficult to digest. But there is a reason why I took this bold approach. You see, there's no doubt in my mind that Jesus is returning to this old world very soon. And one of the signs of his imminent return is certainly the rejection of true Christianity by those who claim to love Jesus. That is why I take God's word seriously and sound the trumpet to a nonchalant generation. Before the dawn of his coming, the Lord promised he would select a remnant, a dedicated people, a holy people, a spiritual bride devoted to his word, a church without spot or wrinkle. And I assure you that not everyone who bears the name of Christian will be part of this end time church. Oh no, on that dreadful day, some will get the surprise of their lives. And those who have claimed to love Jesus and have yet ignored his word for years will be left behind. Can you imagine? What a terrible spectacle, a time of reckoning for lukewarm souls. Nowhere to go, no one to turn to. For those who have served their master faithfully will be raptured, taken away to meet the Lord in the air. And what a day that will be. My prayer is that you will be part of this end time remnant church. And to you I say, lift up your head and know that our redemption draweth nigh. Amen. This is Pastor Stefan Chauvet and this was the word for today. Thanks for joining us on this exciting episode of A Word for Today. Like thousands of Canadians, we pray you've enjoyed the wonderful ministry of Pastor Stefan, because I know I do. If you would like to acquire some of the literature published by Pastor Chauvet, please visit us at awordfortoday.ca. Books and DVDs of previous episodes are available for a small donation. Also, please remember we'd love to hear from you. So. Don't forget to leave your questions and comments so we can interact with you. 
Back to you, Brent. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Pastor Stefan. And thank you all for being with us. Our hero of the faith today is Charles H. Spurgeon, a Brit who was highly influential among Christians of various denominations and was known as the Prince of Preachers. He said, a time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. How smart this man was. Thank you for watching A Word for Today in this, our second season. We hope you can join us again. Good night, everyone. If you enjoyed this prophetic message by Pastor Stefan Chauvet, we encourage you to get your own copy of his brand new book, Signs and Times. All the scriptures and fascinating insights you heard in this four-part series are included in the latest book written by our beloved Canadian pastor. In addition, please consider becoming a partner with the ministry of Pastor Chauvet. With your monthly contribution, you will benefit from rebates on wonderful books such as The Trinity and Chinese Writing Wonders. Partners will also receive a free copy of the book, Born Again, as well as this beautifully engraved A Word for Today flashlight pen, perfect for taking notes during episodes. Place your order now. Call our North American toll-free number 1-877-866-7424 or visit wordfortoday.ca. The toll-free number again, 1-877-866-7424 or visit wordfortoday.ca. Place your order today.